Today, open the taps. The DFA Daily to the 8th of May 2020. Hello again, I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to our latest post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. The RBA published their latest statement on monetary policy today, and in the spirit of DFA, they painted a picture of three potential scenarios for the quarters ahead. In the first scenario, they call it their baseline or gradual recovery, the scenario assumes that most of the current domestic containment measures remain in place for most of June, and most of the restrictions are assumed to have been lifted by the end of September, aside from the limits on very large public events and gatherings, which are assumed to remain in place for longer. International border closures are assumed to be in place until the end of the year, consistent with recent statements from the Australian government. And in this scenario, GDP growth is expected to start recovering in the second half of 2020, led by consumption, although the very large contraction in the March and June quarters would still result in a year-ended decline over 2020. Growth would then be stronger over 2021 as business and dwelling investment gradually recovered, although the level of GDP by mid-2022 would still be below the level expected at the time of the February report. Under these conditions, the unemployment rate is expected to decline substantially from its June 2020 peak of around 10%, but remain above its pre-COVID levels in two years' time. In underlying terms, inflation is expected to remain below 2% over the next couple of years. In scenario two, there's a faster recovery, and a stronger economic recovery would be possible if further gains in controlling the virus were achieved in the near term, and most containment measures were phased out over the coming months. This, alongside the considerable policy support already in place, would help limit near-term damage to businesses and household balance sheets and help drive a more rapid recovery in the economy. An important precondition for this scenario is that households and businesses expect a sustained economic recovery to build over coming months, underpinned by a high degree of confidence in the ongoing management of health outcomes. In this scenario, much of the near-term decline in GDP could be reversed over 2021 as consumption and employment growth rebound, and by the end of the forecast period, the level of GDP could still be a little below the level expected at the time of the February report. Some of this difference can be explained by lower business investment because it tends to lag other components of private demand during recoveries, in part due to lags in planning and construction. In addition, given the assumed ongoing low level of oil prices, work on the currently postponed large LNG projects is not expected to commence within the forecast period. And in this scenario, the labour market begins its recovery as soon as the containment measures are phased out. Because of the better health outcomes and policy stimulus in place, the rebound in consumer demand and reduced uncertainty about the outlook would allow businesses to rehire workers and resume investment plans more quickly. And the hours of existing workers would also increase in response to rising demand, and the unemployment rate would be expected to move from a peak of around 10% to be around its pre-COVID level by mid-2022. The stronger recovery would enable some catch-up in wages growth, and similarly, the stronger recovery would be consistent with a faster pickup in inflation over the next few years, albeit from a low starting point. And their third scenario is a slower recovery. If the lifting of restrictions is delayed and the restrictions need to be reimposed or household and business confidence remains low, the outcomes would be even more challenging than those in the baseline scenario. In this scenario, they assume that many restrictions remain in place until closer to the end of 2020, and international travel restrictions are in place well into next year. In this scenario, it is likely that household and business confidence would remain subdued for longer, and income and spending would take longer to recover notwithstanding the policy stimulus in place. Under this downside scenario, domestic activity would be expected to remain close to its June quarter trough for the rest of the year. A greater share of households would be likely to continue to engage in distancing activities beyond what is required because they remained concerned about the virus. And damage to consumer and business balance sheets and weak expectations for the outlook could mean consumption and investment would pick up slowly, even after the restrictions are lifted. Employment growth would be much slower, 
and the employment rate would remain close to its peak well into 2021. And there may also be some negative effect on the longer term outlook for commercial property. A number of contracts in the bank's liaison program have indicated that valuations of commercial property assets are expected to decline over the period ahead because of lost rental income and lower expectations of future rental growth. In turn, lower valuations may affect the viability of future projects in combination with many firms expecting to reduce their long-term floor space requirements. And this is likely to be most pronounced in the office and retail sectors given the large-scale shift to working from home and the acceleration in the shift towards online retailing. A slower economic recovery would have ongoing adverse consequences for the labour market. The longer the economy remains weak, the more employment relationships are severed and the more households and firms will suffer severe financial stress. And this would slow the recovery further and increase the chance that workers need to take jobs that are poor matches for their skills. And slow recovery and poor skill matching are particularly likely if the economy's industrial structure changes significantly to adapt to the post-outbreak realities. The longer someone is unemployed, the more difficult it is for them to find employment because of a loss or a perceived loss in skills or because they become disencouraged and exit the labour force. Past experience also suggests that workers who first enter the labour market during a downturn are especially affected and can suffer long-term income and employment consequences. And with lower investment as well as poor skill matching, the economy's productive potential could also be damaged over a longer period. A slow recovery in economic activity will be consistent with inflation remaining low for longer and a more protracted period of low inflation outcomes could also lead businesses and consumers to adjust down their inflation expectations, which would make the subsequent pickup in inflation more gradual. Now, I have to say that recent data flows tend to tilt towards the probability of a slower recovery, especially as in the international context, other countries track a slower path to normalisation, but I guess time will tell. Meanwhile, APRA has eased its responsible lending guidelines around the changing of loan terms for existing mortgage customers amid the COVID-19 crisis and has issued guidance around serviceability assessments for borrowers seeking loan relief amid the crisis. The regulator acknowledged that there have been many operational challenges for ADIs or banks in evaluating the long-term impact of economic stress on borrowers due to the virus. APRA stressed that such challenges should not prevent changes to loan conditions where they are otherwise assessed to be prudent. Accordingly, APRA revealed that while full service with the assessments would continue to be required for new lending, it would temporarily ease guidance for changes to existing loan terms, including the conversion of a principal and interest loan to an interest-only loan. Over the next six months period, APRA therefore accepts that some ADIs may not be able to complete a full serviceability assessment for borrowers seeking a change in their loan conditions, the regulator noted. Such changes may include converting from principal and interest to interest only or for the extension of a loan term. However, APRA said that for conversions from PNI to interest only without a normal serviceability assessment, it expects that the interest only term would not exceed 12 months. Where changes to loan conditions are made that result in an interest only period being granted without a normal serviceability assessment, APRA expects that a reasonable period for such an arrangement would not exceed 12 months. And this follows last month's clarification from APRA that for mortgage repayment deferrals, lenders need not treat the period of the repayment holiday as a period of arrears. And in March, the federal government also issued responsible lending exceptions for small business credit. And the government stated that in order to allow lenders to move quickly to support small businesses, it would provide an exemption for this rule for a period of six months. This exemption will only apply to lenders who provide credit to existing small business customers, provided there is an existing borrowing relationship and some proportion of that credit is used for business purposes. And their frequently asked questions will be updated periodically over the coming weeks and months, and APRA encourages ADIs to check the page regularly. And the Treasury has announced today a six-month deferral to the implementation of commitments associated with the Royal Commission into Misconduct in the banking superannuation and financial services industry as a result of the significant impacts of the virus. 
This only applies to unlegislated commitments and therefore does not include best interests. While it was initially believed to include a deferral of all commitments, including the best interest duty obligations on brokers, which many players have been calling for, given the implementation date and the lack of guidance from ASIC. But ASIC today announced it will defer the commencement date of the mortgage broker best interest duty and remuneration reforms and the design and distribution obligations for six months from their original commencement dates given the significant impact of COVID-19 on the Australian economy, especially on the financial system and consumers. So ASIC will defer the commencement date for the mortgage broker reforms until the 4th of January 2021. And ASIC will defer the commencement date for the design and distribution obligations until the 5th of October 2021. The deferrals of these reforms follows and is consistent with the government's announcement today. And so the government says that the commencement dates contained in Royal Commission related exposure draft legislation issued prior to the virus pandemic will also be extended by an additional six months. The delay aims to enable the financial services industry to focus their efforts on planning for the recovery and supporting their customers and their staff this unprecedented time, according to Treasury. Under the updated timetable, those measures that the government had indicated will be introduced into the Parliament by the 30th of June 2020 will now be introduced by December 2020. Similarly, those measures originally scheduled for introduction by December 2020 will now be introduced by the 30th of June 2021. This announcement today balances the needs to implement the recommendations of the Royal Commission with the need to ensure our financial institutions are in a position to devote their resources to responding to the significant challenges posed by the virus, the Treasury said. The changes will also provide certainty and clarity to all stakeholders about the government's commitment to implementing the recommendations arising out of the Royal Commission. And S&P ratings have turned strongly negative on global banks, saying the outlook on global banks has turned sharply more negative in recent weeks as a result of the significant effects of the virus pandemic oil shock and market volatility. We took 175 rating actions on banks between the start of the pandemic and May the 4th, S&P said. Nevertheless, 82% or 143 banks were outlook revisions, while only 18% or 31 were downgrades. We continue to expect that bank rating downgrades this year due to the virus pandemic will be limited by bank strength and balance sheets over the past 10 years. The support from public authorities to household and corporate markets and our base case of a sustained economic recovery next year. Nevertheless, our outlook bias has turned markedly negative following the recent downward revisions of our central economic forecasts, continued material downside risks to these forecasts, and the potential long-term impact on banks' profitability. We expect bank ratings to be largely resilient, they say, but we cannot rule out further ratings actions, including some downgrades, in particular for banks with pre-existing financial strength issues. Although emerging market banks are often more exposed than developed market peers, we expect most will face an earnings rather than a capital shock, exacerbated by lower investor appetite and increasing funding costs for systems dependent on external financing and the oil price shock for some. And how about this for clutching up property straws in the wind? Victoria's peak home building body is calling on the government to encourage cashed up foreign investors to swoop on Melbourne in the aftermath of COVID-19. It comes as experts have flagged interest from China in Melbourne property, but denied there will be a red tide of cash overwhelming Australian assets. Master Builders Association of Victoria Chief Executive Rebecca Casson has urged the government to suspend the 8% in additional stamp duty taxes paid by foreign investors for at least six months as an immediate way to offer stimulus. Every inquiry made by an overseas investor is an opportunity to generate activity for builders and the many other businesses our industry supports, Ms Casson said. At a time when attracting investment into our state economy is vital, this is an opportunity that should be considered. International investment funded large amounts of construction work in Melbourne over the past decade, but has been curtailed by a range of measures. And realestate.com.au Chief Economist Nerida Cosby said that with Australia and particularly Victoria well positioned to rebound strongly from the virus and measures needed to fight it, 
cashed up foreign buyers were likely to search for bargains here. There's tons of money out there and this isn't a financial crisis, it's a productivity crisis, Miss Cosby said. There's a lot of international capital looking at Melbourne and Australia. If we get through this virus reality unscathed, we'll be in a better position than cities overseas to rebound. And Ms Cosby said offshore buyers would be hunting for development sites and industrial properties with big institutional investment groups with assets worth billions of dollars around the globe expected to head the demand. And key signs to watch for ahead of an influx of foreign buyers would be foreign students returning to Australian universities and schools, as well as improving rental market conditions. And the nation's biggest real estate portal has also revealed Melbourne accounted for every one of Australia's top 10 most searched suburbs by buyers in China up to the end of March. Melbourne, Box Hill and Glen Waverley were top of the list, but wealthy hubs like Kew, Camberwell and Hawthorne were also in demand. And more, while a newly released report confirmed the continued decline of foreign investment in Australian properties over the 2018-2019 financial year, the unique confluence of current events may be a catalyst necessary to change the tide, particularly for Chinese investors. Chinese buying in Victoria plummeted after 2016 for three reasons. The Australian bank stopped lending to Chinese buyers, the Victorian government imposed a steep foreign buyer stamp duty, and Beijing started cracking down on the movement of money out of China, explained Zhu Wei Q Executive Chairman Zhou Chami. Those factors have all started to unwind. Today, non-bank lenders are again willing to finance Asian buyers. The 8% stamp duty doesn't look so large when compared to to the 20 percent taxes in places like Singapore and Vancouver. And after years of globalisation, Chinese have accumulated more overseas wealth than they can freely invest outside of China. In April, Chinese buyers made twice the number of inquiries in Australian real estate as in other months so far this year, and 50% more than any month in the second half of 2019. There may have been a great deal of pent-up activity taking place in April, so we don't expect Chinese buyers' inquiries to remain at this height for the rest of the year, but the data shows the Chinese buyers are back. Australia was already appealing as a safe country where your investments are protected. Now the country seems to have managed the pandemic well. That makes it even more appealing to foreign buyers. And marketers in China are already using Australia's good performance to persuade parents of children who have been studying in the US and in the UK to look at Australia instead. And Melbourne is the top Australian city for Asian buyers, followed by Sydney and then Brisbane. At least three quarters of Chinese buyers are looking for property values at less than $1 million, and the median inquiry price comes in quite low at around $610,000. The 2018-19 Foreign Investment Review Board report indicated that mainland Chinese real estate investment in Australia dropped to $6.1 billion over the period. That's down more than 50% from 2017-18 and is at its lowest level since 2012-13. However, Hong Kong Chinese investment into Australian real estate more than tripled from just $2.8 billion in 2017-18 to $9.3 billion last year, while both Singapore and Japanese investments also increased by $2 billion and $1.5 billion, respectively. And Superfund-owned lender Emmy Bank has scrapped its controversial redraw policy following widespread cross-industry criticism. Last week, the bank reduced the amount borrowers could redraw from specific legacy mortgage products without forewarning customers. While permitted under Emmy's terms and conditions, the policy decision was met with backlash from customers, brokers and the broader community. In response, Emmy announced it would review its decision in consultation with affected customers. Emmy has now revealed that it has decided to change back home loan withdrawal limits for any customer who wishes to opt out. The bank has acknowledged that the policy was poorly communicated and has upset customers. Some of our customers have told us they want their redraw limits changed back to where they were before. We are going to do that, Jamie McPhee, the CEO of Emmy Bank, said. We have set up a dedicated hotline for any customer who would like their redraw limits changed back or if they prefer they can request it online. We are deeply sorry. We were trying to do the right thing, but we went about it in the wrong way. 
Mr. McPhee sought to reassure customers that the bank had not removed funds from customer accounts or transferred any customer funds and did not make the adjustment for liquidity reasons. Our priority now is to help support and service our customers, he added. We recognise that we need to do better. We can and we will. And finally, new figures released today from the ABA showed Australia's banks have deferred an extra 100,000 loans, including approximately 50,000 home loans, over the past week to help customers through the COVID-19 pandemic, bringing the total number of loans deferred to around 643,000. This new data released today shows the total value of loans deferred by Australian banks is now at least $200 billion. The total value of loans which has been deferred has increased by at least $20 billion in just one week. Australian Banking Association CEO Anna Bly said this showed that the financial impact of the crisis was still unfolding and customers continue to need support from their bank to get through it. So you can see, on one hand, the regulators are bending over backwards to make the life easier for bankers, whereas on the other hand, many households are still under the gun but for me, the real issue is to what extent we're going to be grasping the property sector as a lever of growth. And as we discussed yesterday, we think that's an extremely short-sighted approach. We need to go somewhere rather different, but that requires vision and new policy. And I see no sign of that so far. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time. 